Okay, ladies and gentlemen, may I request you to kindly settle down once again. We have another power pack panel coming up on stage. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and welcome on stage our moderator, Chief Asset Officer, Beyond Square Foot Mall Management Private Limited, Jonathan Yuck. All the way from South Africa, Jonathan Yuck. Please put your hands together. Guys, can we have some energy? Thank you. Please found our Chief Executive Officer, French Crown. Please welcome Ilesh Devaria. Please Vice President of Operations and Business Development, Naika. Please welcome Kunal Bansal. She is Vice President of Business Development, Being Human. A warm welcome to Preeti Chopra. And ladies and gentlemen, bringing up our panel is Executive Director J Blue Lifestyle, Shambhav Jitendra. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, request you once again to go and settle down. Please put your hands together in a collective and warm round of applause for the entire panel on stage. Can we have a warm round of applause to welcome all of them as I hand over to our most erudite moderator, Jonathan Yak. Jonathan, over to you. Hello, hello. Uh, if someone can fix the lights, please. If someone can fix the lights, it's too much, it's too direct on face. That's much better. Um, good afternoon, everybody. We have an hour together, and my job is to get what's ever in their head out. We've got a bit of a fixed program because of time constraints. We're going to try and get what's. We're trying to. We're going to try and get a download of what's in their heads out in the next 45 minutes, leaving time, hopefully, for questions from the floor and further inter-panel discussion. Hope that meets with your approval. This is, a most topical, this is a most topical conversation, isn't it? Physical and online. And there are many, many, many things that people have said about online and physical. And this entire conference has actually been dedicated to the principles of retail and retailing and shopping centers and online cell phone utilization and all of those sorts of things. And we've got four experts here whom I'm going to ask some pretty straightforward questions. And they're going to explain their particular positions relating to their responses to the questions. And then we're going to have further conversation and discussion. So, to kick things off, Preeti, I'm wondering that because of your business being human, predominantly being a, what we call in the trade, a physical business, an offline business, I've learned a new term from my colleagues here, how does your business particularly build loyalty? So um, thank you, Jonathan, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, well, I am with you. I'm a school, uh, old school thought, so I'll, I'll probably not call it offline. I will still say it physical stores. Uh, so being human, uh, as uh, we all know, that it's actually a brand which has got a very, very wide reach. Uh, yes, with the need of time, uh, we've integrated ourselves being into physical and uh, digital place both. But uh, I am a strong believer and a brand as well that, you know, the way we can reach to people physically is unmatched. Uh, you know how India is uh, that, you know, we, we say that, you know, every, every few meters, the demographic changes. So while you do physical stores, it uh, gives you a lot of opportunity to also touch the local points, basically local flavors, you know, that gives you a little flexibility to not value the brand essence, yet touch the local flavor, which is very, very important for any customer to resonate with it. 
while you're talking about uh, how we make a customer different and probably give a different experience to make them a loyal customer, is that I'll say the physical store opening is actually a storytelling, uh, which is very, very difficult while online. Uh, maybe the product speaks, the USP speaks, but the storytelling happens only when it is a physical store. When I'm saying storytelling means that, you know, you can, with regards to the store layout, with regards to VM, with regards to, uh, you know, how you want to talk to a customer. And India still, you know, believes into that touch, feel, attend, conversation. So these are the USPs which we actually take care of a lot uh, as a brand. Uh, Especially, you know, we, we, we do a mix of large formats, we do a, a mix of small stores all across, uh, especially when there are flagships, you know, we invest a lot into customer integration, uh, which we, we try to understand the customer need, uh, what resonates the customer, um, you know, with our brand and how the customer emotionally connects. I think that's the wire we touch uh, to make the customer a loyal customer. And in your view, do your customers come back? Uh, yes, principally, see, we are, a, uh, you know, I will take a little uh, from the product and where we are, I'll take a little thread to uh, where being human come from. So principally that every, uh, quite a retailers, you know, uh, the, the main reason is business and then they straddle up to, you know, doing social things. But I think being human had social cause as their stepping stone. So that's one thing that, you know, we, we I'm sure that a lot of people know that we give a lot of, uh, some part of revenue to our foundations, to our, so while a, uh, being human customer is, he comes back for a reason. He comes back to give it back to society. He comes back definitely for the product. I'm not saying that that's the only uh, reason that, you know, which, which, us, which is keep us going. But it, uh, it definitely is one particular aspect that bring the customer back because they connect to giving back to the society. You were mentioning that it's a he that's coming back, yet you've moved into... Uh, women's clothing and women's apparel uh, as well. Yes, we have uh, um, addition, and we had women categories since a long time, uh, very silently with a very little depth. But yes, off late we've uh, launched a proper range, uh, which is primarily Gen Z at leisure casual wear. Uh, you know, and uh, uh, a step further was that you know we had Alize uh, as as a brand ambassador. Uh, for us, um, because the focus is now to, you know, increase the depth and conversions out of the women wear as well. And also a step further, I think I'm, uh, pardon me saying if probably we are the only uh, brand who's gone a step ahead and uh, we do a, every season a category called Blur, which is uh, basically for the gender neutral community. I, I doubt if anybody else do that uh, as, a, as a category. And to what extent are women primary buyers of men's wear? from your chain's point of view? Um, largely not, because I think of women buying menwear principally is, I think, the formal wedding, uh, formal wear categories. Uh, so yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's largely men buying men. Interesting. Um, I, I'd like to ask you, Ilesh, um, I think one of the problems with being on a panel, we've had a marvelous time, just so you know, uh, chatting amongst ourselves before we came. We seem to know a lot about each other and what we do. And forgive me if it seems like I'm jumping around a little bit, there is actually a golden thread to all of this, but it's most important, certainly from my point of view, that each of our panelists gets the opportunity to speak and to position their business and their response to the questions uh, so that you can best understand how important physical and online retail is and how retailers are actually accommodating that. So, Ilesh, if I may ask about your growth yeah. in markets beyond the metros and the tier one cities, tell us about how your business, what journey is your business taking your merchandise into the tier three twos and the tier three cities of India? Uh, so, uh, here comes the biggest benefit of uh, being in online space where, you know, uh, my 70% of the business is coming from tier 2 and tier 3 cities. That's a flip card. Amazon, they are also getting uh, more of business from tier 2 and tier 3 cities. If you compare this uh, online segment with offline, I'm, I'm uh, not derogating the offline space. Both are good in its own space. But in, in offline space, you mostly see uh, brands doing well in metro cities only, right? 
let's say uh, if if we take example of zara zara has a really good opportunity in tier 2 and tier tier 3 cities like i am selling short of worth rupees 5000 also in a small uh, city of kerala in small city of karnataka like there are people in uh, you know tier 3 cities who are willing to buy some exclusive products but offline is unable to reach there where online is reaching and how you're predominantly um, an online retailer. If you were to venture into the offline, into the physical stores, yeah. tell us about your strategy. How would you go about it? So, you know, when we discuss like online versus offline, is like Hindu versus Muslim. Who is good? Who is good? Hindu, Muslim, Sikh, Isai, Aapas, Mehum, Bhai, Bhai, Sab, Milke, we all together make the country. The same way, it's like casting, you know, like uh, online is different, offline is different. No, both have their own pros and cons. Like uh, in offline, you can do personalization better. No, no, but I'd, I'd like to lead the answer a little bit differently. Huh. You're an expert in being online. True. What research, what systems, what process would yeah. you follow that, you, that has served you well in the online business Awesome. that you would apply if you were in the physical space. Great. So uh, I'm, I'm in uh, online space for the last seven years, right? There are 26,000 pin codes in India. If I want to open my first store, I know which is the pin code where maximum of the customers are buying from French Crown website, right? Then where, where should be the second store? At which pin, pin code should be the third store? I know it to the point, right? I have uh, more than 12,000 designs on my, web my website. But if I go to offline space, in one uh, EBY, I can hardly put 300 designs. Which 300 should be there on this particular EBY? How I will know? From data, right? At each, uh, uh, each particular location, size ratio would be different. In all pin codes of India, size ratio won't be the same, right? Let's say if we talk about uh, some city in Gujarat, small size would be doing better. Some cities in Punjab, bigger size would be doing better. And it's just, uh, we are not like uh, only better. How much better? That's to the point. Like, kitna bada, bada sizes kitne kitne hone chahiye, chote sizes kit, kya ratio mein hone chahiye. Even a size like 46, 48, 50, 52, even these sizes are also working uh, in my offline space, then I'll know, okay, I should put this size is in my offline stores also, right? So this gives me really deep dive into data. One particular area, if only farmers are working uh, really good in that particular area, area I should put farmers there. If I talk about Maharashtra, it is more formal driven uh, market. If I talk about uh, Delhi, uh, Punjab, it's more of a designer wear kind of a uh, you know market. So that to the point data I have, even if in one particular store, uh, I want uh, how much percentage of product should be formal, how much percent should be casual, how much should be designer. I know to the point from my data that this is this should be the ratio. Out of 300 designs, 50 should be casual, 100 should be this, and 250 should be this. This is the, this is the power of data when you are in online. I'm I'm actually amazed the extent to which the online people constantly educate certainly me in respect to how best to lay out shopping centers, position them correctly, and identify the kinds of retailers. Um, I, I'm I'm actually intrigued in the overlay technology that you apply. Would you apply that in your first and second stores? Would you give us an indication as to which of your where would you place your first store? Hypothetically, without any pressure. Yeah, uh, Mumbai. So, uh, uh, no, there we go, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> so actually, uh, majority of our sales is coming uh, from uh, Mumbai. There are a lot many areas. So first 10 sh stores should be in Mumbai. Then I have Delhi. Then uh, uh, like Bangalore. So I know that these are the cities where initial stores should be. But then I know that after 100 store, 101 st uh, first store, it should be in tier 2. You see, this In is which where, particular pin code? So, Ilesh, this is where you and I are at odds. Yeah. I'm a fond believer in the market that is not in the metro, nor in the tier one cities. I'm a fond believer that our customers in tier two and in tier three cities are just waiting for good retail.
They are waiting for you as retailers to come into those markets. True. And I'm wondering if you would just consider that when you go back to your office. True, definitely. Good. I wanted to ask you, Cornell, in your business, which, is, which was originally predominantly, totally, completely online, that has now moved so substantially and successfully into offline, into real live stores. In your experience, what do you think makes customers feel good? Yeah, so uh, thank you, Jonathan. Um, so luckily for us, you know, Nika as a company, it started off almost 12 years ago now. Um, and that customer connect has been there, the loyalty, um, the authenticity that the products that we provide are, you know, genuine. Uh, which was lacking in you know when when Nike started right so so when they come to us even in you know the physical space um, they expect that same sort of um, you know brand uh, expansion brand width uh, and the quality right and like everybody has said you know the physical space gives uh, allows us to you know show our customer service um, what we've also seen Jonathan is that uh, when customers come to our stores they end up buying, you know, four to five times um, versus what they buy online, right? So that's because when you're there, you're touching feeling, the kind of services that we give, um, you know, cosmetics as a, as a category is so indulgent, especially for women, right? So they come, they spend time, um, and they, we, we give them a, uh, an excellent service, you know, um, across categories, right? So they end up buying a lot more. There's a lot more cross-selling that happens. There's a lot more upselling that happens. And hence, we're able to see, you know, the transaction value go up much more compared to online. Um, so yeah, that's, that's been a customer service and a success story. So it's the physical environment that drives a higher rate of sales? Uh, yes. Greater conversions? Yeah, yeah, so conversions are also very, very healthy. Um, and again, we feel that you know, any customer walking into our store is almost like an F&B outlet where the conversions are north of 80-ish you know, percent. Uh, because they are coming for a purpose, they know what they want, um, and, and again, that's you know served by our um, great uh, you know customer associates, our beauty advisors, our store managers. Um, so yes, the the conversion value is also much higher, and the transaction value is also much higher compared to online. Yeah. I want to dig into this a little bit more with you. Uh, if I had my life all over again, I'd love to be a perfume salesperson because I feel that um, I'd be able to upsell and cross-sell um, and uh, nobody would ever walk out without buying something. And it's got a lot to do with everybody's mood. Uh, you know, your business is mood orientated. Yeah. It's got less to do with, well, I'm smelly and I need something to cover the smell. Yeah. It's got everything to do with how do I lift my spirits. Yeah. How do you go about training your staff? Yeah, so we have an excellent, uh, you know, training team um, that covers all the categories. Uh, we obviously have a lot of training from our brand partners. So, you know, within our stores, we sell a lot of, you know, Indian as well as uh, known international brands as well as own private label brands. Um, and there's a massive training uh, that goes on for every staff in the store as well as, you know, the entire op structure. So it's not just... <clears throat> Um, related to the staff, but also everybody should know, you know what the training is, what the product is, and uh, we keep, you know, broadly our categories are makeup, skin, hair, and fragrances, and that's a topic that you touched. Yeah, fragrances definitely is one of uh, the categories that we are focusing upon, and that's uh, showing a gr great growth uh, trajectory also. Kunal, without giving too much away, do you drive sales performance based on a reward, on, um, on giving commissions? Or do you set a company standard requirement and ask your staff to reach and exceed? No, so we have, uh, you know, a, a great, we don't have a commission structure, but yeah, we do have um, very, very strong, um, you know, uh, salaries as, as well as training and, and the support that we give. And yes, there are certain um, other sort of incentives that we kind of roll out, so yeah. And, and considering that you're an on, that you were previously an online dominant retailer, now that you're in the uh, physical space and doing very, very well, what is your take on the type of lease agreements you're signing in shopping centers? What is the type of, sorry? Lease agreements. Um, so what, what is the type of lease agreements? What, how do you feel about the lease agreements that you presented to sign? Are they suitable to your business 
or would you like to see a little bit more adjustment and a little bit more along the lines of uh, leases accommodating your type of business? I'm only asking this, ladies and gentlemen, because RAI, Retailers Association of India, represents retailers. Yeah. And I love retailers, and I love customers, and I like my own business, which is running shopping centers. And I actually think this is the most important question. Whoever asked these questions, we were given these questions, right? And have you noticed that I'm blending them into mm -hmm. our conversation? The question is flexible lease agreements. So I'd like to ask a little bit more about how do you feel about flexible lease agreements? Yeah, so I think, you know, what has happened is that, you know, Nike being such a strong brand today and, uh, and we have great relations with pretty much all the, you know, leading mall partners as well as regional mall partners, high streets. Um, so it's always a win-win, you know, between us and the partners, um, you know, where the need, uh, where the requirement is for a flexible agreement, we go for that uh, because even the malls want us as well as we want to be present in the malls because we are able to show them that, you know, we bring in the customers, we bring in the footfall, and uh, we're not, you know, cannibalizing the current footfall. We're actually, you know, growing the pie, right? So, so it's a win-win for both. And, uh, you know, once, once, ab once you're able to understand that, and, you know, we are with all the leading partners, malls, um, so we have a, a general understanding in terms of how we want to operate at, at the malls, right, in, in the various cities of India. So yeah, we uh, definitely flexible, and yeah, we would obviously love for a lower rental for sure. I didn't say that. <laughs> I said nothing about rental. The R word did not come up. He raised it, but then again, he is a retailer. Good for you. <laughs> so, um, Shambhar, yes. I'm intrigued with your business. It's a family-owned business, started in Gujarat many, many years ago. It's particular thing with me that I like family-owned businesses, dynasties that are in the making. And how have you been able to, and how do you get your customers to keep coming back? Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Good afternoon. Uh, if I answer your question very well, one thing about our DNA of Jade Blue is service. We win every heart of our customer by providing not only products, but by providing exceptional service. Since we are in this service industry only, and we treat customer as God, so when you offer something to God or when you are treating your consumer, the most important figure for your company as God, so you have to pamper them, you have to serve them the best you can by providing exceptional service and curated shopping experience. So this is how we started because since inception we are into B2C business, business to customer. So this is how we deal. We, were, we are never into B2B where we are have, helping other businesses to grow. We are just into business where we are serving our consumer, our clients. And this is how uh, my parents, I would say in my family members, this is what they have taught us. And this is what we have seen them doing it. And this is the DNA of Jade Blue that provide exceptional service along with the best of the products and understand your consumer needs. This is how, and this is, I mean, something I replicate everywhere, wherever we go. This is a basic training given to our store managers this is a basic training given to our all employees that anything can go wrong, but customer should not be dissatisfied. So this is how it is. So I want to add to what you're saying by asking a question, because remember, our, my job is to get what's in your head out. And I'm intrigued with how a family business has succeeded and has been so sustainable in its market and pan India over all these years. The question I have, is the level of service commitment that you have. You said you give exceptional service. Has it changed at all? Have customers, has the level of customer service you delivered in 1980, has that changed now that we're in 2024? 
uh, I think in my business, uh, when I partic uh, particularly talk about my stores and my company profile, I think uh, it is more or less same. Okay, uh, uh, the entire experience in terms of ambience, I would say, yeah, ambience uh, are different right now. Uh, I guess uh, products are much different right now. We are understanding our consumer much better in terms of their taste of products. But when it comes to a one-to-one -one personalized service, that is something that can never be changed. That is something, it's still there and it is always will be in the demand. No matter how good online business will be there in the future or how many competitors are there in the market, as long as you are providing some exceptional one-to-one -one service and you are knowing your consumer so very well. Today, I have a team of my employees who have at least 100 of their personalized customer who they call at the time of occasions or different times when they, in the times of need, I would say. But there are every employee is having minimum set of 100 customer who they can call and invite for the you know business. I mean uh, to uh, you know sell something uh, out of fresh when there is a new season is going on when there are USS are going on. They call their customers who know that this is a buyer. This is a buyer who will buy in fresh. This is a buyer who will buy in USS. So this is how, you know, uh, this is the kind of a connection my people are having uh, with my consumers. And this is how we, you know, train them as well. So what is so remarkable about this particular panel, ladies and gentlemen, is that the questions that were asked uh, of me particularly to ask them is in respect to retail expansion, omni-channel, flexible lease agreements, sustainability, community engagement, digital transformation, data-driven decision-making. You've noticed that I think I've done my job, I've touched on all of that. But I think that the points that are common on this stage are the quintessential points that make us enjoy retail so much. We are human. And when I started my first strategic leasing plan for a shopping center in Cape Town in 1995, I was reminded of this by the Faith Popcorn book, Cocooning. She made the point that the essence of being human, not to coin a phrase, Preeti, but the essence of being human, is that in the shopping center retail environment, we like to be seen and we like to see others. And the golden thread that's coming through our conversation, certainly from previously when we were just the five of us, and now on stage, and you're benefiting from this, is that of distinctive, unique service. And for the next half an hour, I'd like to keep that conversation going. And I'm very grateful to you to introducing that. Preeti, in your business, how do you provide distinctive service so that your customers keep coming back and you grow your business? I'll take a thread from where he left uh, that, you know, uh, what is the difference in the customer before and now? Uh, a customer today is a little more aware, a little more educated. Uh, thanks to the social media, omni channels, or online, uh, he's well informed. By the time he's coming to your store, somewhere he's made up his mind that what he wants to buy. Uh, so I think distinctly what we offer to a customer is, uh, I would say the product has to be a hero. I mean, for sure, you know, that, that's one thing that brings a customer back to you. Uh, no matter what, how much we talk about experience, service, if the product is not right, uh, that's definitely has to be a hero. But other aspects that brings the customer back is that connect, that emotion, that empathy, uh, and that resonation the, the, the customer has with the brand. Like earlier also I said that, you know, uh, for us as a being human, when you're buying a garment or you're, uh, you're wearing one, I think um, you're wearing, we're wearing an art because of so much that goes behind, uh, which is not much talked, not much seen uh, behind that garment. So I think what we ideally uh, focus is certainly on the product. Uh, we uh, focus on the experience. Uh, we believe that the customer while walking out of a store is not just carrying a garment, he's carrying an experience and an awe with him. And that is probably one thing which will always bring him back. Otherwise, the market is very cluttered. Uh, a customer has a lot of options. Uh, uh, you know, one can actually sit on a couch on a press of a thumb button, can purchase what one has to purchase. What, one, what brings customer back is a relationship which one builds at that physical store. Hence, I always say that while we were debating also that for me, what physical store can do, I, I, I beg my pardon that I don't think it's very, very possible with the online. 
the other aspect like what she said that only the physical store uh, helps us tell us a story uh, helps upsells cross selling which is which is certainly important for any retailer to actually you know focus on good well, thank you shambhar can you embellish on 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 that point relating to customer service from your own business's point of view i know you've spoken about the distinctiveness but how do you actually do it you've got a chain of how many stores did you say uh, we are right now chain of 40 stores 40 sure. of jade blues and yeah i mean as a group we are 80 stores but yeah with jade blues to talk about it's 40 stores and counting it's an empire and and i'm i'm in the i'm in the hands of empire builders uh, i was at the iff where we were confronted with people telling us that we were going to op- they were going to open a thousand stores in the next 5 years as a south african i just cannot comprehend the numbers you're in the best country for retail congratulations embellish on how you deal with customer service uh i believe today customer is uh, very much evolve and as we talk about technology and uh, you know the way everything is going with uh, the di- digitalization people are spending lot more time on tech so customer is definitely tech aware as mam rightly said he is aware on what he wants to buy at the same time he can definitely go through your website because website or online shopping is definitely there people are there who wants to see first just they want to get educated about your company your brand they study you first and then probably they come to your store or even they purchase from your online website but eventually i personally believe that when it comes to service online i can sell product i can uh, sell story to my consumer who is there online buying from digital media but when it comes to offline when it comes to into my physical stores or probably he has that mindset that this is a product i have seen here but you know i mean apparently it is something i need to feel first and then probably i can pick it when i go physically there to the store randomly any time so uh, when he uh, passes by or crosses by our store and then he recollect oh yeah i have seen something like this on the, uh, on their website okay let's go and try so at that time even if he is a new cousin a new consumer for me new customer for us at that the same time if he is finding our product so right uh, so well balanced for him the way he imagined along with that what as you can sell you know a cross selling that is very important thing cross selling what kind of cross selling you can do at that same time because he is a first time customer to you not only product but what you are providing him apart from product will make your company grow so i believe in cross selling i always uh, treat my team that way uh, we have our in house training center where we train our sales people our sales force i think sales force sales people when it comes to physical retail the most important people are they i mean i give them the utmost importance to my sales team because eventually they are on the floor sir we are sitting in a high offices and we are making decisions for the company's growth that is true but eventually the numbers are coming from the bottom from the floor so i think my sales team is the most important part of our company and we provide them the best of the training to ensure that satisfying your customer is the biggest joy in the world many many years ago uh, when i was a trainee manager at the marks and spencer of south africa called woolworths and i ran the food market at the biggest um, store they had in in eastgate in johannesburg there was a small problem they'd run out of or we had run out of tomato sauce and i remember this lady was looking for tomato sauce and she was getting more and more irate and the floor manager called me because apparently i was the manager and i heard myself saying to her madam i am terribly sorry we are out of tomato sauce however we do have baked beans in tomato sauce and if you are prepared to strain the tomato sauce from the baked beans you get an advantage you get the beans and the tomato sauce thank goodness she had a good sense of humor and she did actually buy two tins of tomato sauce but i'm wondering why that kind of repartee 
that kind of conversation is not almost possible here in India. We were talking earlier as panelists and as colleagues and as friends that the difficulty that our average sales person on the floor has is actually speaking to the customer. It isn't a problem in Nairobi or in Cape Town or in Johannesburg or in Dar es Salaam where I've, or even in Sri Lanka, that people do not have a problem or a concern about speaking to customers. It is an issue, certainly from my point of view, because as I explained to my esteemed panelists, as a mall person, I'm interested in revenue share. I'm interested in conversion and in sales. And if I can dr excuse me, drive a higher sales in the stores, we can earn a higher revenue share. And I'm thinking that up to 20 to 30% of potential sales is lost because our staff don't speak to their customers. So I think, uh, uh, like, I'll just take a thread that um, while we train our staffs, uh, I think we need to train them rather than to be suggestive, to be more educative. Very, you know, they can tell uh, probably, you know, that what, what can be an addition to the bag rather than only suggesting that, would you like to buy this? I think that transition of training is, I think, missing, and I think we all need to focus on that a bit. Well, let's develop that a little bit. Um, Kunal, in your business, uh, how many stores do you have now? Uh, we have 150 plus stores in the beauty space, and stores. otherwise, if we count it's everything, empire. yeah. So it's, it's, it's amazing. amazing. Yeah. Okay, and how do you address the upselling and the cross-selling and this engagement with customers? This whole thing about um, um, developing the customer service and applying it. So yeah, that's a you know a good question, Jonathan. So I think like everybody else has said on the panel. Um, First of all, customer service, you know, all, all great companies take customer service very, very seriously and it goes up all the way, you know, to the top, to, to the um, chairman, right? And that's where it's driven down, down to. So in terms of that, we have a very, very solid, um, you know, training team that takes care of, you know, a, the customer service and then obviously all the other tactics in term, and strategies in terms of, you know, cross-selling, upselling. And like I mentioned, we, we deal with these uh, various categories, right? So... Um, we educate our uh, beauty advisors and our store managers on each of these categories, not just to, you know, um, so when a customer walks in, he or she, you know, uh, might be looking for something, but if, like you mentioned, that product is not available, what's the next best alternative that they can give them out, right? So, and, and then, um, if they're only looking at makeup, how do we look at the other categories, which is the skin, hair, and fragrances, right? So, so that sort of training goes in uh, completely. There's a very, very solid network and a very good training team that we have who have immense experience in these categories themselves and in the other art of retailing and, and whatnot. So that is, um, it's a regular exercise. It's not a one-off. It doesn't happen, you know, once in a year, but it's a continuous um, exercise that keeps happening with our store teams. And that's the only way we can keep, you know, upskilling them also. I have an anecdote to share with, with, with the room and with you particularly. And that is that in, in South Africa and in East and in, in Africa, there's a, a very, very, um, a, a, a very, very good outdoor uh, retailer called Cape Union Mart. And the reason why I mentioned it is that uh, their, their staff training is based on how the staff member, the sales member, perceives the customer. So the staff members are almost little psychiatrists and psychologists, right? If you're looking a little bit dull, they tend to be hands off. Thank you, madam, thank you, sir. I'm here if you need me. Superbly well trained. But if the customer has an iota of engagement, then the fun starts. And I've got an anecdote for you. When my children were, they, were this high, and they were going to camp for the very first time, and by the way, uh, we, I come from a family of Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, so it was a scout's camp, and inevitably they needed a sleeping bag and a pair of boots and a torch. And I walked into the waterfront store, and I bought a torch, an ordinary torch, mind you. And as I'm walking to the till point, the guy who sold me the torch, who helped me decipher 12,000 torches, and this was the one perfect for your 11-year-old daughter, he screamed at me from the back of the store, sir, 
sir, wait. And I immediately thought, had I stolen something? Couldn't be. Had I missed something? Have I lost some teeth? No. He ran to the front of the store holding the batteries. I've never forgotten that. Because that to me was the epitome of independent thinking sales craft. The kind of service that I would imagine you would learn if you were working at the Oberoi Hotel or at the great Indian hotels. You don't get that level of service in hotels around the world, I might add. But here in India, I'm wondering, could we ever get that kind of sales craft? And Ilesh, how many stores do you have? We don't have stores. He doesn't uh, have, have any online. stores, but he's building an empire. Yeah. If you had stores, how would you introduce that kind of sales craft? How would you bring customer loyalty and salesmanship into your business? So, uh, like, uh, what we are doing is uh, saying yes, of course, to every question. Like, uh, our customers are, are coming. There is one suit, uh, single breasted suit. Right? He says, I want double breasted in the same design. Yes, of course. Sir, I want my initials written on my cuff. Yes, if my name is Ilish Gavaria, IG should be embroidered on my cuff. Yes, of course. Sir, my height is 6 and 2. Generally, all retailers uh, manufacture garments for 5 9 height. Right? My height is 6 2. Okay, extra inches in length, possible. Some people from China, Taiwan, coming to us on our website and saying my height is 5'2", five 5'4", five possible. Yes, we can reduce length of the suit for you. But you don't have an experience, as our other three esteemed panelists have, in actually doing this. You've got this invisible... No, we are doing it in online. You're doing, so it, online. Yeah, but online, doing it online. Yeah, but online, I'm sure everybody would agree, is very different to being in the store. I don't know whether this panel is um, incidentally or consciously divided into the two online and the two offline, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, people who believe in true, uh, I think, offline more. <laughs> yeah. And I'm thinking that this is the best education you've ever, ever had because you're surrounded by people who are all retailers. I yeah. think I'm the only real estate person, <laughs> so I'm feeling very brave. And you're surrounded by people, particularly on this panel, who are all physical store operators. So there are some, uh, you know, experiences which we can give in uh, online, like opening a parcel, opening a box, unwrapping the ribbon, uh, you know, unwrapping the butter paper, and then uh, you are taking the shirt in your hand. That's the beautiful experience. Taking out the note, handwritten, thank you so much, Ilesh, for purchasing fifth time from French Crown. Here is your small gift of your uh, hand, of your name written on metal pen. But That's you're not it. doing that physically. You're doing we it are doing online. It online because I know this, this customer is buying fifth time. So I know. That's why I can give him a small gift. You know, that is how uh, we are uh, you know, improving our uh, customer experience. When we were on the panel, um, I've been asked to repeat a little anecdote. May I do that? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So my anecdote is as follows. I'm thinking that the level of retail service, particularly in shopping centers in this country, is very good. It is surpassed, in my view, when you go to the IFC in Hong Kong. And the experience that I've enjoyed, and most customers enjoy, is that when they drive in, the number plate recognition system recognizes that you are a regular customer, and it says, welcome, and the boom goes up, and you drive in. For those of you who do not have that privilege of being a regular customer, you've got to take a ticket and you've got to do all the other things that go with it. When you drive your car into a particular most value customer's uh, drop-off point, there's a valet standing there who knows your name because it's number plate recognition, right? And they say, thank you for coming, madam, sir, um, and we'll be looking after the car. Oh, what I didn't mention to you when we were in the room was how do you get the car back in the first place? Oh, it's very simple. Because you're a most valued customer, you actually have an app. And all you do is you literally press a red button. And you've now got 15 minutes to get to fetch your car. Because they would have valeted the car. 
and they would have had the car brought to you within 15 minutes. Their guarantee is you get your Rolls Royce or your Mazda or whatever within 15 minutes. Ah. And so you have got 15 minutes to finish your meal, get out of the movies, finish your shopping, and that's when you get your car back. I think I left you all hanging, thinking yeah, but, where yeah, is it? The thing is, you know, I wanted to share the, big, the, the beginning of the story as well, Jonathan, you know. Uh, I haven't got to the desk. Exactly. I'm going to get to the desk. All right. <laughs> they, they, they are very exactly. smart and they've all got good ears. Very good. So the story is that I, I knew the uh, general manager of this entire beautiful property and uh, Bruce had been involved in shopping center development in South Africa and I was his guest. And we, he and I were standing at the customer services desk. And the question that I'd raised with my panelists, my friends, colleagues, was why on earth, if you're a super wealthy, a great customer, would you want to go to a customer services desk after you'd spent $500, $1,000? Why? Doesn't make sense. Beggar's belief. And Bruce, standing with me, shoulder to shoulder, said, you just got to watch this. And we were watching well-heeled ladies and gentlemen standing in a queue. And when they got to the queue, the customer service agent would say, welcome and thank you for shopping here again. By the way, unbeknownst to me, and now I know, they've got a panel TV behind the screen, behind the desk. They knew exactly who you were because the camera had picked up who you were and the name was there and all your shopping trends and proclivities and everything else. So they were able to say, thank you for coming back, welcome. And oh, by the way, we've got a little gift for you. Thank you so much for coming. This is a little gift. And in the box was probably $100 worth of gift items. I don't mean to belabor the point. I'd like you to realize that almost every single most valued guest at the IFC on a daily basis stands in the queue just to be received, to be welcomed, and most importantly, to be thanked. They are thanked personally by the customer service agent sitting at the customer services desk because in our culture, from a retail management point of view, you actually do want to reach out and touch your customer. You do want to thank them. And that was, I think, something that touched on you as well. Imagine doing that in any of our shopping centers. And I was told by my friend Bruce, go stand in the queue, see what happens. So I stood in the queue. Unbeknownst to me, Bruce had put in all my biometric information. And the lady behind the counter said, Mr. Jonathan, welcome to the IFC. I see it's your first time here. So we're going to give you a token mailbox. The mailbox is different to the female box. And because we know you're going back to Bangalore, it was written there. She'd never met me in her life. Um, we're going to give you a box for you and a box for your wife. And that was like seven years ago, and I've never forgotten the incident, and I can't wait to go back. <laughs> Did I miss anything? That, for me, has been the epitome of high customer service and what we call touch. And when I went back to Bangalore, I reviewed the work that we were doing in our shopping centers, and I realized that if we could touch you, if we could find a way of getting to touch our customers in some way, that would bring them back. We speak about customer service and loyalty and bringing customers back into the shops. Well, how about shopping center people recognizing that we've got to do the same thing with our mall customers? And it is possible by greeting a customer, by welcoming them, and by treating them in a very positive and in a very engaging and in a very welcoming way. Sorry to interrupt the flow of the conversation, but it was something, Ilesh, that you said. You're doing it so successfully, but I think that we need to try and do that equally as successfully in the physical environment. So what are you going to do now about opening stores? <laughs> okay. So, yeah, we, we will implement all this uh, thing together in offline also. So one drawback in offline is you can't uh, have a lot many designs in one particular store. That's it. Uh, in one, one EBO, you can have 300 uh, designs. On my website, I have 12,000 designs. Right? I mean, it's, it's, itself is a mall. 
12,000 designs. Now, how I can bring those 12,000 designs in this 500 square foot EBO? What we can do, we have 300 designs. Now, customer comes and asks, uh, I want black checkered short, right? If you, if you try, try this in offline space, go to any store and ask very specific two combination, one color, one pattern. You will hardly find one or two option, right? Put this two filter on Mantra, on Flipkart, on my website, you'll find 50 options, right? What we will do, we will give tablet to a customer. You can touch and feel the products. You can try the size. Now, what you want, if you want something which is not available in store, you can order from the tablet. I want to be part of the team that puts the store, uh, Ilesha's <laughs> business, into shopping centers. And I think that the way to do it is yeah. exactly as you've suggested. So, it's the options store. Yes. So, uh, but the one thing that you're going to have to realize is that the customer satisfaction of actually buying something that day and walking out is not going to be possible. You're going to have so to come back. What, what happens is, let's, let's say a customer want to buy five shirts. I have an offer, buy four, get one free, right? Out of 100 options, he can buy two. But what about other three products? He can uh, uh, select it from a tablet. We are giving tablet or a huge screen, right? On, on screen, he can scroll the designs and uh, uh, see the products. Two, he can buy from store. Three, he can buy from uh, the tablet uh, or the screen. This is how we can maximize the output, output from that 500 square foot area. Well, I just think it's, it's absolutely wonderful. I'm, I'm very conscious of time, and I want to make sure that members of the audience, you've paid to be here. I'm hoping that you're getting good value. You're getting the wisdom of these wonderful people and their experiences. What questions do you have? Sorry to cut you short. Questions. Now, listen. If nobody here asks a question, I've got about 17 here. But you don't want to hear my voice. So come on. Questions? 12 minutes and ticking. I see a representative from Rye walking quickly to the edge. She's probably going to be signaling at 10 minutes because that was my agreement. Ladies and gentlemen, okay. Yes, at the back. Sorry, you need to stand up and speak loudly, please. And just ask a question. Yes. Yeah. Uh, my name is Yobin. Uh, I wanted to kind of know what uh, the 3D space uh, in augmented reality with the Apple products coming out, how is that going to influence shopping behavior, if at all there is any impact on that in retail? Did you hear? Space. Yeah, I mean, I can take this question. Uh, if I understand your question, if I have understood your question well, uh, this uh, 3D space which is going to take space in a store, are you talking about? Yes. In and, a store, right? Offline. Yeah, exactly. So this was just rolling in my mind as well. Uh, I guess customer or consumer who is stepping into a store, maybe may get, he get or she, may or he or she get attracted to that particular space or something because it's new, okay? Anything that is new will definitely consume your mind. But uh, after seeing and going through it, a customer or consumer, as per my view, will definitely require a personalized service, again. Because to try the outfit, okay, a 3D image probably can give him an outlook how it would look, but the thing is, Unless and until he or she tried the garment or product, how well it is actually fitting me, how well actually it is suiting on your body, he or she won't be having an idea about it. So yes, it is important. It should be there just for an experience, but it should not discount your personalized service. So that's all I said. Thank Makes you. Sense. Thanks. Um, would you, any of you like to add? Would any of you like to add? I'm very concerned about the technology not enabling the retail decision. I call that a gimmick. It's like a little game. It's a gamification of retail. And in many respects, it's proved to be a little bit of a distraction to retailers. Too much space being allocated when in, to gimmicks when in actual fact the space is so valuable and so expensive that it should really be used for retailing. Preeti, would you agree? 
yeah, partially yes and partially no. Because uh, like, you know, I think uh, the era which we are living is a fidgetal retail. Uh, where, you know, both of that integrates each other, complements each other. My only worry is it should not end up competing with each other. So till the time we are able to use these two aspects and technologies and uh, integrate in favor of a brand, works well. And Kunal, would you like to add anything yeah, to that? Uh, no, I agree to what, you know, Shambhav and Vilesh and Preeti mentioned. And we have some of those um, tools also in our store. So, <clears throat> uh, and, and to your point, Jonathan, you know, it should, it, um, the retail space is very, very valuable. And, and those tools are meant to help the customer. So we have those tools which, you know, actually help the customer identify the product, um, diagnose, you know, what is it that they need, uh, because ours is about beauty, cosmetics and whatnot. Um, so it helps diagnose, you know, what after that tool, you know, what should be the end product that could help them out, you know, with their, um, whatever it may be in terms of cosmetics or hair or skin. Uh, so those are the tools that we definitely deploy. And, and to what Shambhav mentioned is, you know, that's where uh, the physical space and, and the beauty advisors come also because the tool can be used even online, right? So there's n number of tools online with, with a lot of brand partners, but that's where the knowledge, the expertise of our beauty advisor comes into play with using that tool, you know, how do you actually, you know, help that customer out? I would not say convert that customer, but actually help the customer out in identifying the right product. So, so we definitely have those tools and yeah, I think it's a mix. We have to have that, but it should not be very gimmicky. I agree. Good. Thank you. Um, question. I think you just need to speak. See what works. Yeah, there you go. Hi, uh, thanks for moderating a lovely panel. Uh, my question is to Kunal and to Ilish. Kunal, uh, by virtue of Nika and being a digital first brand and then having an offline presence, this is the question related to the endless aisle. So while Ilish said that you have the option of trying out something and picking it up, Jonathan said that that the joy of taking it uh, is why most people come offline. So you guys have the best experience because of the 150 stores and the multiple you know, options available online. What percentage of customers are open to endless aisle and what percentage of customers really say, hey, I've come here to try, buy and take it home. So what's your take on that? Yeah, so that's a good question and that's something we're trying to solve also. So we definitely have endless aisles in our stores, um, you know, because um, like Ilesh mentioned, we have thousands of brands on the online platform, right, out of which we are able to bring the top, top brands into the physical space. Now, obviously, you know, the customer might be looking out for something else which is not there at that store at that moment and which is why we encourage endless aisles. But again, the customer might not want to because it's instant gratification in the store, which, which is what they're looking out for. Uh, and which is what we also want to service. But having said that, yes, there are a few, uh, the percentage is not very high at the moment, uh, but we definitely want to, you know, try and encourage our customers because they know that when they're walking into the store, they obviously have a Nike app in their phones uh, and it's easy for them also to buy, you know, why would they buy on, buy the end side? But that is something we want to educate that, uh, that's where the beauty advisors come into picture key, you know, hey, this is something, if not here, we, we, we give them an alternative. So we try and service the customer's requirement then and there as much as possible. If they're looking out for something extremely particular, then we encourage endless side of for them to kind of purchase on their own. But yeah, it's not a very high percentage. Of Thank you. I, I think it's a fabulous question. It reminds me um, of how more formal retail became uh, successful in, uh, in, in Africa, from Cape Town, South Africa, all the way through to Egypt. And, and that was simply the, the art of retail is the art of education and experimentation. I think that we'd all agree that in order to be good retailers, we've got to give our customers the opportunity to touch and feel, sorry, Ilesh, and to experiment and to ask questions, which then means that our customer service staff have to be able to respond. They must be up with the latest customer knowledge and they must be able to sell. Would you all agree? Good, another question? Okay, fine. Uh, moderator's uh, privilege. I have a question. <laughs> We've not raised this, by the way, so none of this has been rehearsed. But 
in literally a minute each, I'd like you to just identify in your own experience and business where lie your pain points. If you had an opportunity today to solve one of your pain points, what would it be? Uh, for us, the biggest pain point is uh, discounting. If I could control discounting and concessions and four months of USS running across India, I guess that's the biggest pain point we are having in our industry. I would like to re-correct it, rethink of it, and uh, just, you know, just reduce the period of USS and let the company, let the retailers, let everyone just grow well. Because after giving so heavy discounts and offering so many promos, you are actually, you know, just luring customer to your store, definitely. But eventually, if you are just believing in making top line, and not making anything at the bottom, if you're not bringing anything, if you're not getting anything at your home, at last, then what is the point to be in the business? I agree. So, trust me, this heavy discounts and promos should be, you know, should be controlled. That is my pain point. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to write a book at some stage, and one of the chapters is going to be The Great Indian Sale. <laughs> and it doesn't stop, does it? It just goes on and on and on. And I feel very strongly that for the survival of retailers, not least of all the online and the physical retailers, there has to be a defined period for a sale. But then that's just me, and I'm old-fashioned. So. We have solved it, actually. Oh, uh, yes. The guy with so no stores <laughs> has solved it. We are it. the first mover. Pray in tell. In, in our website, there is no USS. There's like, if, if a shirt uh, MRP'd at uh, 2,400, it will hardly go to 2,000. Nothing less than 2,000. It's not like we 50%. If I'm selling a branded shirt for 1,200, a, a, a shirt worth rupees 2,400, in USS, it is at 1,200, I'm definitely diluting my brand. You're right. So that's where we have uh, found the solution. Why actually uh, USS need to be there? Because you have done our production. What we in French Crown is doing, we uh, offer a lot many options, but in each option, there will be limited inventory. So. Uh, I don't have to, uh, I don't have a lot much inventory. That's why I don't have to put the sale. Simple. Ah, the nirvana of being online. Uh, tell me, just while we've still got you with the microphone, any pain points that you'd like to share? Yeah, touch and feel in online. <laughs> that is not possible right now. So can't wait can to get, <laughs> I can't wait to get behind a table with him and negotiate a lease agreement. Kunal? I think uh, for us, it is that, you know, uh, we're still not there in every, you know, part of the country and, and you know, democratize uh, eco uh, beauty products. So, yeah, that's, I think, which we're solving for. So, we are looking to expand a lot more um, and, and, and to give a great customer service to all our customers um, across the country. Thank you. And uh, Preeti, any pain points? So, I think in a physical space, uh, no matter what strategies we make, whatever we want to do, but the moment of truth lies on the floor. So I think we all the retailers uh, face with the quality staff and the kind of training, uh, which, which is, I think, a long way to go still. We say that, you know, we spend a lot of time and effort onto training, but I guess it's still a long way to go. Excellent. Well, I see that we've got a minute and 18, 17, 16 seconds, so I'm going to sum up. Um, and I'm going to stand for this. Firstly, I'd like to thank you all for being such wonderful hosts and listeners and for the questions. Not with the greatest of enthusiasm, I only got two questions, but it's okay. I'd also like to extend a very grateful thanks to you as colleagues, friends, and panelists. Uh, I've had the opportunity of spending more time with you because we were waiting for the session to start. So thank you very, very much. I'm sure everybody has enjoyed your wisdom. So I come at my career, as I'm a, a property asset person, I come at my career with a job description. My job description is real, very, very simple, and it speaks to this industry, the retail industry. My job as a property owner, a property manager, is to make sure that whatever the retailer needs to do, they can do. Because after all, retail is a reflection on society. Are you listening? <laughs> Our online friends. Retail is an experiential art, and in order for that art to be brought out and to engage with customers. Us in the real estate game, quintessentially the physical of the physicality of retail and real estate, is to make absolutely certain 
that you guys, you retailers, can do your job. So, see, time is up. I think we've done very, very well in our hour allotted. You've been a great audience. You've been a brilliant panel. Thank you very, very much, ladies you, and gentlemen. Thank you, Jonathan. You have been a great moderator. Thank you so much, Thank you. Jonathan.